Uh, thank you for that introduction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a new tracing JIT compiler for Racket that we've been working on at Indiana University, uh, but also with some of our colleagues at King's College London and the Hasso Plattner Institute. So Racket already has a JIT, per se, but let's start out with an, kind of a motivating example to see what's wrong with kind of the current situation. So here's a simple definition of our dot product function. Uh, we even added some contracts in there to make it nice and safe. Uh, unfortunately, it's not particularly fast. Uh, it takes about nine seconds to run on the sample data that I cooked up. Now, the first thing we want to do if we want to make it run a little faster is uh, we can subtract out the contracts, right? So that safety has a pretty significant runtime cost in this case. So we subtract those out. We're about two and a half times faster. If we want to get yet faster still, we have to do some manual specialization, kind of work, do the work of the compiler for us. Uh, we specialize some of the uh, for sum construct and some of the arithmetic. And we're, again, about three and a half times faster. But if we want to get uh, as fast as we can out of Racket, we have to drop down and write parenthesis based C, basically. So this is what our fastest dot product implementation looks like running through Racket. We're now uh, significantly faster, about 33 times faster than the original implementation. Unfortunately, we've had to brutalize our uh, function pretty significantly. And that's kind of unfortunate when you're working in the second best programming language. <laughs> uh, so we developed Picket, which is a new tracing JIT compiler designed to kind of deal with this issue of uh, doing the compiler's job for it. So here are the run times for Picket on the same four dot product benchmarks. And over here are the same racket times. Not only are we significantly faster in every case, but the difference between our fastest and slowest version is only about 20% rather than 3,000%. So at a high level, the idea is we want to apply modern dynamic language JIT compilation techniques as opposed to what uh, Racket currently does, which is basically ahead of time optimizations plus some lazy code generation. And to do this, we make use of some existing work that comes from the R Python project. And this is a project that came out of the development of PyPy. Uh, it's a language and framework for implementing efficient dynamic language interpreters, most notable for its inclusion of a fast JIT compiler. Uh, that you can take advantage of simply by writing an interpreter for your language. So a little bit about the high-level design first. Uh, so we didn't want to go through the trouble of implementing uh, things like Racket's macro expander ourselves because we hear that's not particularly fun. So instead what we do is we bootstrap a functioning program making use of kind of the existing Racket macro expander. So when we want to run a program, we first fire up a Racket uh, a separate Racket process, which runs a little script we have. Uh, that in itself invokes Racket's macro expander and gets us down to Racket's core forms, which is a relatively minimal AST representation of our program. From there, we serialize that out to disk via JSON format and read that in on the picket side, doing some relatively m minor cosmetic modifications to make our life easier. And that AST is what the interpreter operates on. There is no subsequent uh, bytecode compilation as is typical with high performance dynamic language VMs. Instead, what we do is we feed that into the CEK machine, uh, which was nicely developed for us by Matthias. <laughs> um, and it's typically used to specify the semantics of the lambda calculus. Instead, what we did is we scaled it up to work on all of Racket's core forms, and we just feed the resulting Racket program in. So the kind of high-level uh, way this works is you, we have this step function which takes an expression, an environment, and a continuation. And it steps the program, one evaluation step, producing a new expression, environment, and continuation. And this has a couple notable advantages. The CEK machine, by construction, implements proper tail calls. And since we're already manually managing this continuation term, implementing uh, high-level control features like call CC is relatively straightforward. So, and that's the full structure of the interpreter. I'd like to talk a little bit about the compilation strategy 
that we make use of here because it's significantly different from what most uh, JIT compilers use these days. And it's what's known as trace compilation. So rather than doing subs or kind of iterative transformations on the AST to work your way down to low level machine code, trace compilation works by kind of instrumenting the dispatch loop of your interpreter. This is typically done in a bytecode interpreter setting such that after you execute each bytecode, one per iteration, what you do is you record into some buffer a sequence of instructions which emulates what the interpreter just did. So if you just did your multiplication bytecode operation and both of its arguments were floating point values, well, you emit a sequence of instructions that emulates floating point multiplication. And uh, you, during interpretation, you continue to record these until your buffer fills up, at which point you shift, shift that, excuse me, you shift this buffer off to your compiler, generate code for that path that you recorded through your program, and when you reach the uh, point in your program again that initiated this uh, recording process, you just jump to that piece of code. With the caveat that if control flow should ever bail out or should ever diverge from what you just recorded, you need to bail back to the interpreter until you can ge generate code for those subsequent execution paths as well. And eventually you will end up completely fleshing out all of the relevant paths through your code. But doing all that instrumentation and implementing uh, all of that compilation framework is a lot of work still. Instead, we make use of the existing JIT that comes with our Python, which is what is known as a meta-tracing JIT compiler. Uh, this is how it manages to be language agnostic. The idea is it operates one level up from a standard tracing JIT compiler. So instead of recording operations as they're performed by your source code, instead what it does is it observes the execution of the interpreter you just wrote and records the operations performed in the interpreter. So now, simply by observing the interpreter, you're now, you're now compiling the language that you're interpreting. And obviously, you have to provide enough hints so that the JIT can properly optimize the resulting code and remove the interpretation overhead. So we take that process and we apply it to the dot product function that we saw in the intro. And this doesn't really matter which version. Uh, the code generated is largely the same. And so it has these two, starts off with these two guard expressions, which just make sure we have not run off the end of either of our input arrays. Uh, two array fetches to get the next uh, item at each, uh, at the current index. You multiply those together, add it to the accumulator, and you just increment your two loop counters. So we have one counter for uh, indexing into each array, and then you just jump back up to the top. And this is pretty close to what you would want out of a C compiler generating a dot product function, right? Uh, you're operating over unboxed arrays of floating point values and doing arithmetic without any extra interpretation overhead. This is how we managed to get so much faster than Racket on those particular examples. But you know, this is a research project consisting of only about 14,000 lines of Python code. How much of Racket can we actually implement in you know, that small amount of code with that little uh, human resources? And the answer is a surprisingly large amount. Uh, this is where implementing uh, Picket as a CEK machine comes uh, in real handy because it's a very high level implementation. So we have functioning file I.O. Uh, since we need to run all of these benchmarks and show off how fast we are, we obviously have to implement the full numeric tower. Uh, we support Racket's contract system, including some of the more advanced features baked into Racket's runtime, like impersonators and chaperones. Uh, since we support that, uh, it's not too difficult to go from there to supporting typed Racket. And uh, just to give you an idea of the remainder, uh, there are a lot of primitive functions baked into Racket's runtime, about 1,400 of them. Of those, Picket implements about 900. And granted, those 900 are the ones we most need to run benchmarks, but it still gives you kind of an idea of how much work is left to, do, to be done. Uh, there are a bunch of things that don't work or will be difficult to implement just due to the architecture we've chosen. Uh, implementing the FFI will take some, uh, probably be, uh, time-consuming and error-prone to map everything to the equivalent R Python constructs. Uh, we don't support Scribble. Uh, anything that requires a GUI or network access is currently not supported. 
Uh, as of yet, we have not implemented threads, though there is some, we are looking into a green thread implementation that will at least uh, allow us to execute examples which make use of threads. And obviously, those 500 remaining primitives would be something that, that we would like to implement at some point. So the dot product example made things appear very rosy. Uh, we were significantly faster than Racket, and the story isn't always that good. Uh, we have inherited some of the well-known performance edge cases that uh, tracing JIT compilers have, uh, which is anything with very branchy, irregular control flow, uh, code that isn't easily expressed as a loop. Uh, trace compilation is based around compiling loops. If things don't actually look like a loop, we're not going to do particularly well. Uh, the canonical example is anything that looks like an interpreter, uh, something with one loop that has hundreds of cases dispatching to various handler functions is typically a bad performance spot for tracing JITs. But anything that fits into straight loops or numerical computation, we're excellent at. Uh, we definitely win at least all the numerical benchmarks. And so, as you can see, we've got two benchmark suites here. One is the Larceny benchmark suite, which is about 50 benchmarks. Uh, they run on a variety of systems, so we compare Racket and Picket, but also Larceny, Gambit, and Bigloo, which are three ahead of time optimizing compilers, all fairly effective at what they do. So, and then we just uh, take the geometric mean across all 50 to boil it down to a single number for comparison here. Uh, as you can see, Racket is the slowest by a fairly significant margin, with the next three being the uh, ahead of time compilers. But significantly faster still is Picket, clocking in at a little over 2x faster than Racket. And similarly, we took the uh, Racket entries for the programming language shootout benchmarks. And again, Picket ends up being about 2x faster, uh, with the caveat that these are ones you would expect our Racket to do as well as possible on. These ones have gone through the manual specialization process that we did to that dot product function. So this is kind of the optimal case for our Racket. But it's useful as a point of comparison because we can get an idea of how dependent Picket is on this manual specialization process as well. So what we can do is we can take those shootout benchmarks, manually despecialize them, inserting uh, more generic arithmetic operations, uh, safer forms of operations like vector ref. And when we do this, racket slows down by about 30%, whereas picket only takes about a 6% performance hit here. So since we're already significantly faster than racket, it's fairly safe to conclude that we're also much less dependent on this specialization process to get anywhere near that good performance. Uh, so a little bit of future work, things we're looking into or things we would like to improve. Uh, we do currently implement impersonators and chaperones and generally across the board we outperform Racket on programs that uh, make use of impersonators and chaperones, but we're looking into ways to slim them down further and expose more of their structure to the JIT compiler so that we can get even better performance and hopefully significantly less memory usage. Uh, we'd also, we're also looking into exploring the interaction between the ahead of time optimizations that are currently performed by Racket and those that are performed just in time by the R Python JIT. Currently, we cannot take advantage of the ahead of time optimizations because we operate on Racket's core forms rather than its bytecode representation, which is what uh, Racket's optimizer operates on. So we're looking into pushing that uh, later on and interpreting something later down the compilation pipeline. Uh, as I said before, we want to implement green threads in particular to uh, explore optimizing inter-thread communication and scheduling patterns to kind of expose that to the JIT and optimize away thread boundaries. And obviously, improve performance on complicated control flow, which is really the worst case for Picket. Uh, because of Picket's architecture, it takes a particularly large hit on programs like this. And obviously, we would just like to support more of Racket. So, uh, that's all I've got. Thank you for listening. Great, that was excellent. We have time for one, maybe two questions. So 
Ah, Trey. Can you talk more about examples where it performs poorly? So you said complicated control flow. So for instance, with the like the standard scheme benchmarks, is the Boyer Moore one of those that you don't perform well on, or do you do well in that? Can you go and when you don't do as, is it that you don't do as well, or you actually ra are beaten by racket? That uh, kind of question. So there, there are definitely cases where we get beaten by racket. Uh, these end up being pathological cases where if we don't optimize well, we the resulting assembly code basically ends up simulating the CEK machine still. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to reason about which examples those will be. Small changes can have pretty significant impact on how effective the JIT is, but there are definitely examples in the larceny benchmark suite, for example, where we're 2x slower than racket. So the Boyer Moore is actually an interesting example because there are, we, ha we have a couple versions of Picket floating around and there are some where we do significantly better than Racket and a couple where we do significantly worse. So it's a little schizophrenic.